serve a great God, don't we? God is good all the time, and all the time God is good, and oftentimes we need to be reminded about that. <clears throat> and that's that's often what we do when we sing, right? We're reminded about God, we're reminded about who He is, and um, oftentimes we can read words on a page, we can even hear people tell us words uh, that sh- are encouraging words, That, but sometimes a song just does it, right? Sometimes you turn the radio on and you hear that song that encourages you, or you just come to church and you hear that song that encourages you, and that's what it's meant to do. It's meant to build up and lift up the name of God to prepare us for the preaching of God's Word, and that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to hear God's Word preached, and I'm going to do my best um, feeble attempt at giving you the Word of God this morning, and I pray that um, the the preparation and the study that I've done this week would be an encouragement to your hearts, but more importantly, the Word of God would encourage your hearts and point you in the right direction, right? And uh, we're finally coming to the end of this series, uh, we're going to be in Galatians chapter 6 and verses 11 to 18, the end of the chapter, just to give you kind of a uh, look ahead to where we're going to be going here in the fall, starting next week, we're going to be going through the book of Ezra um, and Nehemiah, um, the, and the reason we're going through both of those books is because at one time, Ezra and Nehemiah, it was one book. And so it is one continuous storyline through two different prof, uh, two different uh, men of God. And so um, we're going to be st- starting that next week. I'm excited to get into uh, those books with you starting next week. And uh, But until then, we're going to continue and finish uh, the book of Galatians. And I trust that this has been an encouragement to you. Uh, I, I believe that the gospel ought to be an encouragement in our hearts and in our lives. And when we continue to hear it preached, continue to hear it taught over and over and over again. It ought to encourage us. It ought to move us through um, the hard times of life. How many of you had a rough day this week? Okay. If you didn't, praise the Lord. Okay. How many of you have had a rough day in the last month? Okay. All of us, right? And it is the gospel that continually gets us through and continually motivates us to move forward, right? Because this life is hard. It's difficult. It's frustrating. Okay. We had some frustrating days this week. Um, uh, we're redoing our bathroom, and uh, <laughs> we uh, got a bathtub for our um, bath bathroom, and it was broken. So we took it back, got a second one, brought it back, it was broken, and uh, took it back to the store, and they had three other ones there at the store. I looked at all three of those. All three of those were broken. Um, so we ended up having to go far away to go get a bathtub. Finally have a bathtub that works, and it's been installed now, thankfully, to Mark. Um, but uh, uh, we had some frustrating times, right? And now, broken bathtubs should not be the end all of the world. But for many of us, those frustrations can lead to other frustrations, can lead to other frustrations. And it's the encouragement that the gospel brings that Jesus came, he died, he rose again. He had the ultimate worst day on the day of Calvary, right? And he died for you and for me so that we could have a better day with him in heaven one day, right? And so the gospel should be what enlivens us. It ought to be what brings us hope and what brings us joy. And that's really what this entire book is about, is that Paul uh, is fighting for that truth, that hope, that encouragement to all believers. And so we're going to conclude his letter this morning. And it is my desire that uh, if we haven't already, that at the completion of this letter, that we would draw some hope and assurance from the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if it is what, uh, if is what, uh, if it is what Jesus did for us that gives us strength and gives us hope, we can move forward uh, in the days ahead. And so, if it's what we, because if it's about what we've done, which Paul gets at in this letter, if it's about what we've done that brings us hope, boy, many of us aren't going to have very much hope at all, are we? And so Paul is trying to get that through to his friends in Galatia, and he gives one last plea to them this morning to please don't jump on board with this false teaching that it's about what we do, because if it's about what we do and not what's already been done, we don't have any hope. And so he gives them one last plea, one last warning to not run with the false teaching of the law. And so um, our main idea this morning is going to be this, that they boast in ability, but we boast in the cross of Christ. 
They boast in ability. We boast in the cross of Christ. In Sunday school this morning, we've been we talked about this idea of boasting, boasting in our accomplishments, boasting in what our possessions are, uh, boasting in what God has given us, right? Instead of boasting in the God that gave it to us. And so that's what Paul's getting at here is that the same thing can be said with how we get to heaven. And it is the Judaizers that boast in ability, but we boast in the cross. And so let's go ahead and look at chapter 6, verses 11 to 18 again. I want to read it again um, because maybe some of us weren't listening or maybe I wasn't even paying attention as I was reading it. But the word of God, uh, I want to be lifted above my words this morning. So let's look at verse 11. Paul says this, See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may be boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the, lo- the, wor- the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you, brothers. Amen. Let's open with a word of prayer this morning. Lord, we come before you this morning, Lord, asking that you would rid our hearts and our minds of distraction, that we would put those aside for this small amount of time we get to hear your word taught and preached. I pray that you would cleanse me of sin, that you would rid me of self, and that you would help me be an instrument, Lord, as I uh, preach your name and your word to the hearer. Lord, let us take this word and apply it to our hearts that we might serve you better. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So this passage this morning kind of piggybacks off of the last few. And we have mentioned uh, this idea of pride and conceit. Um, If you remember at the end of chapter 5, Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not defy... you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. And then he closes that chapter with saying, if we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with it. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. So he's saying, if we walk in step with the Spirit, the Spirit that has come down and imparted, uh, or has been imparted into our hearts through the work of God at the moment of salvation, that Spirit comes in and does its work. Now we have to give in to the Spirit and Bible and Paul says when we do, this is what is a reflection. It is somebody who is not conceited, not provoking, and not envying. And then he goes into chapter 6, and he gives us some different characteristics of someone who is a believer and how we ought to treat the church. And he uh, mentions all of these things. Um, and But in there, in verse uh, 3, he mentions, For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself talking about this idea of pride again, that we cannot and we will not be able to live the Christian life if we do not give into the spirit and live a life filled with pride and conceit and always thinking about me. Right. And so we have to have that mind of uh, absence of pride in our lives and more of a surrender to Jesus to be able to understand and to be able to carry out what he's talking to and uh, helping us understand about this morning. So. You cannot live the life we're called to live with pride and conceit in your heart. Uh, And you also are not saved by what you do. You are saved by what has been done for you. So that when you think about that, right, it ought to put us low and God high. When we think there's nothing we can do on this earth that's going to be worth anything apart from Jesus Christ. Right. And when we put God in his proper place, that also puts ourselves in our proper place. Right. And so. Uh, We have to have that mindset as we move forward. And that's Paul's thrust in this passage, that he will contrast the Judaizers with the Christian. He's going to do that this morning. He's going to contrast the Judaizers' uh, motivation behind uh, what they're trying to do. And then he's going to talk about the Christian's motivation uh, in their life. 
And so he's going to say, as I mentioned, they boast in their ability. We boast in the cross of Christ. Okay, so if you would look with me at verse 11, we're going to see our first point this morning in the message. I got four points, um, two of which are the same, the first and the last. Paul mentions this. I, uh, this um, if you look at verse 11, he says, see with these large letters I'm writing to you with my own hand. This is Paul's way of saying, listen up, right? Listen up. I have something to tell you. He's saying uh, up until this point, Paul was dictating this letter to somebody, to a scribe who was then writing this letter down. Okay, That's how Paul wrote most of his letters. He would tell somebody something, and then they would write it for him. And so Paul is saying to them, though, listen, I'm writing this now. This is my, me. See, I'm writing with all large letters. This would be the equivalent of somebody texting something to you all in all caps. right? They are, there's an emphasis to this, that I want to get this across to you. So please listen up this morning. And so um, he's using these large letters for emphasis. Um, and so he also could be penning these letters to um, validate the authenticity of this letter. Remember, at the very beginning, they were questioning his authenticity. They were questioning his authority, right? They were saying, well, does he really know what he knows? And is he really uh, is he actually telling us the truth? Remember, they had this question in their hearts. And Paul wrote to validate his authority given to him by well, not just uh, the disciples, or not just God, but also the disciples. And so he used many different arguments uh, to argue his authority given to him by God. And so he, this could also be, he's, he's saying, listen, I have something to say. What I have to say is important, right? And so uh, he's saying, listen up, here's what I have to say, which transitions into our next point, which is that they are boasting in their abilities, they are boasting in their abilities. Verse 12. It is those who want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised and only in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not keep themselves, do not themselves keep the whole law, but they desire to have you circumcised that you may that they may boast in your flesh. So who is he speaking of here? He's speaking of the Judaizers. Remember these Judaizers that came in and taught that you also you have to be first become a Jew in order to be saved, right? You have to convert to Judaism. And so he's talking about these Judaizers. Um, and then he's saying that the Judaizers want to make a good showing. Make a good showing. What is he trying to get at here? He's trying to get, they are trying to give a good impression or they're trying to boost up themselves in the eyes of the religious leaders of the day and make themselves look good by getting people to convert to Judaism. So he's saying that they want you to convert to Judaism just their own self-interest. Because when you convert and they say, oh, I got 200 converts this week, they can go up and report that to the Jewish hierarchy and say, look what I did as a Jew, or as a, uh, a Jew I converted all of these people to Judaism this week. This week, we mentioned uh, earlier on in um, uh, Sunday school this morning, I mentioned, and now if your church is growing up, did this, I know you didn't have this heart, but other people might have, right? We have those plaques that are up on the board, right? Or up on the wall in front, and they post the numbers of baptisms and the numbers of salvation and all of these things that were on the wall to show how many and how great our church is because of all of the, the, the baptisms and the salvations we have. Yet, all those people who were supposedly baptized and saved aren't sitting in the seat, right? We had that happen so many times in my church growing up. We would have the numbers plastered on the boards of all the salvations that we had so that we could feel good, yet none of those people that were saved were sitting in the pews today, that day. Right now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't rejoice in what God does, but what I'm saying is that it shouldn't be with selfish gain, right? That, oh, look what we did. No, look what God did. Okay. Now, I'm not saying every church that did that thought that way, um, but I think in lots of ways, doing that can encourage us to think that way. And so, um, but we ought not to, we ought to be boasting in God. And that's what Paul's saying here is they want statistics. They want numbers. <clears throat> but they shouldn't be wanting numbers. They should be wanting to boast in the cross of Christ. And so he's painting this picture between the Judaizers and true followers of Jesus. One last time, he's making one last pitch effort to get these people on board. 
back on board where they once were. And so the fear of others was obviously a significant motive of the Judaizers. Because what does he say at the end of the last verse there? If you look at the, or sorry, the end of verse 12. He says, in order that they may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. They feared what others thought, didn't they? They tried to accommodate the gospel to the Jews to avoid persecution. They believed that if Gentile Christians were to be circumcised and if they kept the law, there would be no persecution and there would be no rift with the Jews of the day. Remember, in chapter 2, it was said that Peter feared the circumcision party. You remember that? Peter feared the circumcision party. Why did he fear them? Because they persecuted the Jews. They would persecute them. They would, they would uh, persecute them that did not adhere to the law. Why? Well, because... They didn't adhere to the law. They weren't eating. Uh, they were eating with Gentiles. They were not recognizing the the ceremonial laws that they needed to recognize. All of these things. And when they didn't, the Jewish leaders would say, "See, you're not on board." And so, hence, they would appease, and they sought a middle ground that we well we can mean we can take the gospel, and but we can also convert to Judaism, follow after these laws, and still have grace. And it sounds very familiar, doesn't it? People distorting the truth in order to appease and satisfy the opinions and emotions of the ones who disagree. Man, I think I see that every time I turn the news on. They, they try to make things that God's word says is absolute truth, and they twist it by giving it a new name. They call it reproductive health, right? Instead of calling it what it is, murder, we're going to call it something else. And they twist, and they twist. Make words mean what they don't mean, and they, 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 they say, well, it's, why do we do this? Well, because we have to appease to all. Well, you can believe that your God is what gets you to heaven, but I'm going to believe that my God, can, and, and in the end, it's all the same. It's all we're worshiping God, being good people, and we'll get there, right? No. How do I know that? Because the Bible says we cannot mix false and truth. You can't do it. They oppose each other. This is what Paul's saying. When you follow after the Judaizers, you are boasting in yourself and you are compromising truth. Verse 13 says, For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they, are des they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. They say that they are holy, and that if you don't follow the law, you aren't righteous. We are righteous. Follow after us. Do what we say. Do what the law says. Paul says, well, guess what? They don't even follow after the law themselves. <laughs> they think they do. They say they do. But they don't follow after the law. Why? Because what does Jesus say? Jesus says, if you lust after a woman in your heart, you have sinned against God. So it begins here. And yet these Pharisees are out there saying, well, me, as to the law, I'm perfect. No, you're not, because what does Christ say? And so yet they desire to follow after the law. Why? So they can boast in their statistics and so that they can appease the other side. We, church, we aren't here to appease the hearts of man. We are here to please the creator God. Paul says, listen up. What I have to tell you is the conclusion of my, lesson, my message, and it's important. The Judaizers boast in themselves. They boast in their own abilities. But the true Christian boasts in the cross. Boasts in the cross. Look at verse 14. But far be it from me to boast in 
except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. Instead of fearing the persecution of others, which is what we often do when we make decisions in this life. We fear persecution, and so therefore we talked about this on Wednesday night. Fear drives our decision making. But when instead of fearing persecution and and boasting in one's abilities to make converts and gain righteousness through the law, Paul tells us to boast in the cross of Christ. Unlike the Judaizers, our motives are pure. That's what Paul's saying. Their motives are statistics. Their motives are to appease. Their motives are to gain a friend. The Christian's motives is to simply please God. Hence, we boast in the cross of Christ. Instead of boasting in my own self-righteousness, I'm going to boast in what really did something for me, and that is the, the cross of Jesus Christ. Because our abilities get us nowhere. And then he goes on to say, by which the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. What is Paul saying here? He's saying, because of what Jesus did on the cross for me, that unselfish act, that world has died to me, and I to the world. What is he talking about here? Crucifixion was a brutal form of execution. We know Jesus went, he died on the cross, and it was the most brutal form of execution in that day. Even today, it would be the most brutal form of execution. And yet Paul is saying uh, that as far as he's concerned, meaning the material things of this world, the possessions of this world, the accomplishments and all that goes with it, he sees that thing as being as what, as what is up on the cross. That is being dead to me. None of this matters. I don't care about my accomplishments. I don't care about any of the persecution that may come my way. All I care about is the rewards in heaven that, I'm go and, uh, that Christ promised to me as a result of what happened on the cross of Calvary. doesn't matter. The world died to me and I've died to the world because none of that stuff matters anymore. You know, I see this, this perspective in older folks that us younger folks don't have. <clears throat> and that is perspective changes, right? And the stuff that used to matter to us no longer matters anymore. Why? Well, because they're probably closer to their time with Jesus than the rest of us. But perspective shifts and all those things that they thought mattered, the accomplishments in life, the things that they had, the money, the wealth that they had that's now gone because, you know, people took it, the government took it from them, and now that stuff doesn't matter anymore, right? And they start to begin to have a perspective shift and they start to think, the only thing that matters to me, and they start to think spiritual things, is that my kids and my grandkids and my great-grandkids know Jesus? That my neighbor hears about Jesus. Right? That all of, and, and everything begins to be what it should be our whole life. Our whole life should be that my kids, my grandkids, my great grandkids know Jesus, that I know Jesus, that I'm living for Jesus, that I'm making everything about Jesus. That's the way we should live our lives. That's what Paul's saying is that none of that matters. The world, it died to me. Why? Because the cross mattered. Because the cross happened. And I've chosen to place my faith and trust in that because of the grace of God, the grace that God showed me. Not because this law happened, not because I converted to a specific religion, but because Jesus Christ died on a cross, and the cross is what I'm going to boast in, not my own abilities. And he's saying, yeah, these Judaizers, that's what they're boasting in. They're, get, they're boasting in you converting. They're not boasting in the cross of Jesus Christ. And in verse 15, he points out, for neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. So like he has said all along, the whole circumcision, uncircumcision thing, it really meant nothing. It really means nothing. Why? Because the cross of Christ is what means, or is what means something, is what matters. You're not separate. 
uh, you are separating into groups for nothing is what Paul's saying. You have this group of Jews and this group of Gentiles. God says, you're all my chi- children. If you place your faith and trust in me. And here you are separating into groups, playing favorites for nothing. Circumcision doesn't make you a new creation. Not being circumcised doesn't make you a new creation. Jesus Christ and his work on the cross and your faith in him is what makes you a new creation. Max Enders in his commentary on Galatians says this. I thought this was interesting. It's, it is easy to get caught up in the externals. This is what Paul's saying they're getting caught up in. Paul says, in all reality, the externals are meaningless. What counts is a new creation produced by a new spiritual birth. What counts is God changing us from the inside out. The message of the Judaizers was powerless to change hearts. What changes hearts is faith in Christ for both salvation and for spiritual growth. And we can become so focused on the doing part, and we forget the part that really matters, getting to know him. Because Paul says what mattered to him, the world is dead to him now. So then what matters to him? What is his goal? If, if accumulating all of this stuff here on earth is not his goal, then what's his goal? Why is he focusing on helping these people in Galatia and helping these people in Philippi and helping these people in Colossae? Why is he taking the time to do this? I'm going to show you why. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. We were in Philippians this morning in our Sunday school lesson, so for those of you that were there, close your mouth. Don't tell the secret. Paul says in uh, Philippians chapter 3, verses 7 through 10, He says, but whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him in the power of his resurrection and may share in his sufferings becoming like him in his death. This is what matters to Paul, that he knows him. That's Paul's goal. Why can Paul say that the world means nothing to me? Because he has another goal, and that is to get to know his God that he is going to spend eternity with. And yet, as Christians, how often do we spend trying to get to know the Creator? I mentioned it to our people in Sunday school this morning. Not very long. There's 168 hours in a week. I think that's the number, right? And we spend about 50 of them sleeping, 50 of them working, probably 30 to 40 of it, spending time taking care of the, the deeds of the world we need to take care of, and very little of it do we spend getting to know God. And for some reason, that little bit that we spend is okay for us. Paul says, the world, all that stuff means absolutely nothing to me. Not that I'm not going to have to work and to take care of the responsibilities that God's given me to take care of. But my main goal in life ought to be getting to know the God that I'm going to be spending all of eternity with. You do recognize that, right? Like, I, don't, I can't comprehend eternity to me, right? I've only been on this earth 33 years. But, like, it's a long time, right? And yet we're so worried about the few amount of years that we're going to spend on this place that we call earth. Not, I'm not saying we don't need to take care of the responsibilities that God gives us, you know, like taking care of our kids and making the money to take care of our families and put food on the table and so on and so forth. But perspective, people. We need to know that God. That's, that's our, that is, as a Christian, that is our, should be our goal. That is our calling. 
is to get to know our God. And that's why Paul could even say the things he's saying, because he knows his God and he has a desire to know him deeper. That's how we become a new creation, a new creation, sorry, not by being good or by being a part of a group or by following a list of rules, but by getting to know our God. He says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation in Christ, right? A family of God by faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That is how you are a new creation. The old has passed away. The, old, the new has come. All this is from God who has through, through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Church, those verses tell me right then and there that we are only saved, we can only become a new creation because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And so when we boast, we aren't boasting in what we did because you and I did absolutely nothing. It is by the grace of God that we can even place our faith and trust in Him to begin with. And the only reason we have anything to boast upon is because of the cross of Jesus Christ. And yet here we sit here and we talk about how great we are because of all the abilities and things that we have in life, the talents that we've been given, which I don't think I have many of, but I've been given some, right? And so those talents and abilities are what we try to post ourselves up with, our titles in life, what I have in my job and my, you know, the spouse that I marry and the kids that I have that are doing such, such and such, right? None of that stuff matters, church. That's all been given to you by who? God to begin with. None of that is yours. It's his. And so who should we boast in? We should boast in Jesus Christ. Verse 16. He says, And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. He's saying peace and mercy are available to all who believe in salvation by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. I talked about all of us have had bad days. For many of us, right, we had bad months, maybe bad years. We live in life without hope. There's a lot going on in our world that can zap our hope. But we have hope because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And we can have peace and mercy because of that. What is the one thing that politicians promise in their election cycle? Peace, right? I'm going to bring peace to the Middle East. I'm going to bring peace to both parties. I'm going to unite our country, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. And whole, I think wholeheartedly they believe they can do it. But they can't. And they never have. Both Democrat, Republican, Independent, whatever other party, Socialist, whatever, whatever you want to call it, none of them have brought true and everlasting peace and mercy to their people. Why? Because they just can't do it. And yet those politicians stand up and they boast in their own abilities and it's just not possible. Paul says peace and mercy can only come to those who believe in salvation by faith and trust in Jesus Christ. That's it. It's the only way that you can experience true and everlasting peace. Not by converting to Judaism, but by trusting in, by faith in Jesus Christ. And so after making that claim, Paul gives one last listen up. Look at verse 17 and 18. From now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ can be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. He began with listen up, and he closes with listen up. Here's what we ought to set our mind on. Paul says, from now on, let no one cause me trouble, 
For I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Paul gives the Galatians one last piece, one last part of his credentials. He says, I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. Now, all of us are fairly familiar with Paul's life, right? Paul had gone through stoning. Okay? He has gone through shipwrecks. He's been bitten by snakes. He's been beaten. He's been thrown in prison. I mean, there isn't much more that a person can endure. And Paul's saying, all of that, all of the marks I have on my body. Imagine, just imagine, I mean, we can't, but imagine the, just the stoning alone, not the shipwreck, the poison snakes, all that stuff. Just the stoning alone. Imagine what toll that takes on the body. Most people die from that in those days, but Paul lived. So imagine the marks on his body just from that alone. And Paul says that he bears the marks of Jesus. What does he mean by that? And, that, and, and mind you, these the, the recipients of this letter, those who were reading this letter, would have known what Paul went through. Okay, This wasn't shocking to them. But what does he mean by that? These markings on his body are a sign that he was a slave of Jesus Christ and not a slave of the law. He knew that his body belonged to Jesus. And these physical scars were Paul's final credentials of authenticity. He's like, if there's anything that you can see with your eyes and hear with your ears to believe that what I'm saying is true, just look at the scars on my body. They indicated that his motive was to please God regardless of the consequences. He's saying, look, and he says this earlier on in the book, if this weren't true, I would do, why would I do this? <laughs> right? Why would I take the time to, to, to get stoned and to uh, all these things, go, shipwrecked and snakes and people hating him and throwing him in jail and risking death? Why would he do that? Why? Because he believes in the cross of Jesus Christ to be the only way to heaven. And so... He, he's basically saying, listen, I've earned the right to be heard. And so he begins the letter with arguing his authority and authenticity, and he closes the letter arguing his authority and authenticity. And then he closes with the theme of his message, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. He begins with grace. In chapter 1, he continues with grace in chapter 3, and he closes in grace in chapter 6. Why? Because it's a message of grace. And that's Paul's heart, is that these people understand that it is a message of grace, not of law. So what is our takeaway? What is our take home this morning? So what? Just one take-home point, and that is stop boasting in your ability like that, like you have it all together. And start boasting in the one that holds it all together. Some of us try so hard to keep it together. Because we got to look the part, we got to act the part, we got to speak the part, so that all the people around us think that we're good and we're all right, and I got to come to church with my freshly pressed shirt and and inside I'm in turmoil. Knowing that you can't hold it together. The only one that can is Christ. And yet inside we think and we boast in our ability to just continue on and I can take anything that you throw at me. And we can't. We need to quit acting like we can. Because we can't. Only Jesus can. So instead of boasting in self, 
about you try boasting in the cross of Christ that strengthens you and gives you those abilities to accomplish what he's asked of you to do. And then I have a little part at the end here. That is, that's our application for the message this morning. But I want us to take an application home from the entirety of the book. As we look at the totality of the book of Galatians and this idea of a message of grace, what is it that we can learn? Well, there's two people in this world. There's the unbeliever and the believer, meaning the unbeliever, someone who has not faith, placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ yet. Maybe you even believe it all, but you haven't actually turned your life over to him. And then there's the believer, someone who has surrendered to Jesus Christ and who has admitted their sin and, and believed in what Jesus did for them and confessed that all to God. There's those two types of people. I want to talk to both of you tonight, today, because I'd be... Uh, I'd be ignorant to think that everybody in this room knows Jesus. I, I, I hope and I, I pray that everybody in here knows Jesus. But I'd be remiss not to uh, give you and implore of you this morning in the unbeliever. Quit trying to work your way into eternity and have faith in the work that's already been done for you. It's not about the good outweighing the bad. Because let's just be honest with ourselves. The good doesn't ever outweigh the bad. It just doesn't. So quit trying to just do it. And just give in to what Jesus told you and what you know is true. And that is that you're a sinner and that you need a Savior. And that that Savior's name is Jesus. And that Jesus went to the cross, died on that cross, and went to a grave, was in there three days and three nights, and rose from that dead and conquered sin and conquered death so that you could have the opportunity to place your faith and trust in that work so that then you could live in eternity with him. And then the believer. What is the believer's take home from the book of Galatians? And now there could be many. Okay, and probably for each of us, there's a different one. But what I want to be the take home for us today is that not that we take this message of grace and use that grace as an opportunity to serve self. But here's what I want it to take home to be for the believer this morning. Use the freedom that you've been given to serve him and to love others. We've been given another chance on life when we trust in Jesus Christ. And a lot of us use that opportunity of the second chance to say, all right, I'm good now. I'm going to heaven. I can live it up down here. And Paul says that we don't have the freedom to serve self. We've been given freedom to serve Jesus. And so my challenge for you this morning is to use that freedom that we've been given to serve him and to love others. That's my desire of our church, is that we would take the word of God, and that we wouldn't just read it at face value, but that we would dig in and try to find what is our application for life today. Because it all has something to teach us. Every word on this page is designed for you. You just need to figure out what that is. And I hope that going through this book this, this, well, this summer has helped us see how to do that, how to dig into God's word and bring application to our life. And so I challenge us, let's use the freedom we've been given to serve him and love, love others. Let's pray.